think there's a, a great word in this today, and, and I believe the Lord's going to use it. Let's look together at verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 12. If, you, if you're a guest with us today or you don't know it, we're in a series. This is week number 8 of a series, all from 1 Corinthians. We have a couple of weeks left in the series, and we'll be wrapping that up and going into Legacy and then At the Movies. How many of you are ready for At the Movies? That's going to be be great this year and then we'll go into a Christmas season, Advent season. It's going to be a great, great finish to the year. Let's look at verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says this, he says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be, come on everybody say it, uninformed. I think it's the King James Version. It says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to not know what, 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 what's happening with, with gifts. Gifts are important, and, and how they work in the body of Christ is important, and you guys are abusing it, and you're dysfunctional. And the way you're using the gifts is creating division, and, and that's, that's not what it's about. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed. So um, based upon a problem that he hears is happening in the church, he's going to address it here in chapter 12. So again, there, there, there's some dysfunction, there's some division, there are people kind of competing for position or favor because they think that their gifts are more important than somebody else's and, and maybe a little more spectacular or sensational and they think there ought to be preeminence given to them. And, and Paul um, comes into that and he says, look, the gifts, all of them are for one purpose and that is to build up the church. They're to be used for the common good. You don't have the gift for you. I go so far, I may go a little too far, but I think the idea is even helpful. And if you disagree with me on this, it's all right. I don't mind uh, at all. I, I almost, because I see the scripture says they are the gifts of who? Who do they belong to? The Holy Spirit. I don't... I, I have a struggle even saying that I have the gift. And again, I, I, you're going to show me scriptures that say that, that we are given gifts. I'm going to contend a little bit with you and say, no, we get to steward gifts. They are gifts that belong to the Holy Spirit that he allows us to be a, a steward of. And so that puts, for me at least, it puts a, a better frame on it. Whether it's 100% right or not, it helps me to recognize, look, this gift, is an, it's not even about me anyway. That I have been given the privilege of stewarding gifts that belong to the Holy Spirit to build up the church and to serve people, to serve the common good. And, and so Paul goes on to say, look, each gift is given for the benefit of the entire body of believers. It's not given for any individual's glory. Oh, I have the gift of prophecy or I have the gift of this or as if that person should be glorified because of the gift. Never. And Paul says, look, that's the reason there's some strife among you is because you're thinking that someone is more spiritual because they have a certain gift than somebody else who, who is serving the, 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 the body and serving people. But it's, it's, it's a gift that you, you've degraded and looked at a different way. And he says that's wrong. And he, and he even talks about the unity of, of the gifts, even in the diversity of them, by, by saying it's just like your body. Your physical body has many parts but, but how are you going to, to say, um, based upon uh, one part of your body, that another part of your body is unnecessary? How, how are you? He says, look, they're, it's, it's, they're all needed. All of the gifts are needed, and all of the gifts are important. And, and all of the gifts are to be valued, and they're, and they're part of the whole. And, and, and all of the gifts are what hold it all together. Um, the next part of the letter that we'll deal with next week is chapter 13. It's the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13. It's the one where uh, love is described, the dimensions of love, the, what, what love, what it means to, to love. It's, he's, as far as the context, he's coming right off of dealing with them about gifts to say, look, if what you're doing, you're not doing out of love for the, the body, for the family, for the people. If you're not doing what you're doing out of love, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. 
He says your gifts mean absolutely nothing. So, so it's never about our ability or our, our gift as important as um, they are. It is about recognizing I am, I'm part of something that is bigger than me and, 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 I'm, and I'm just a part. I'm, I'm just a, a part. And, and no gift is more important than another. All gifts are, are to be used to, to, to build unity, to, to promote unity, and to build one another up. And, and so, so he's, he's really leaning into this idea, look, the focus is not on the gifts, but the focus is on what do these gifts have to do with a, a unified kind of interconnectedness of a, of a loving family of believers. It totally dismisses the idea of consumer Christianity of, uh, I'm just going to go to church, be there for an hour, 15, 20 minutes, and leave and come back the next week for church. The assumption here is that you are part of a body and you have a function in that body. Some of y'all might be like, well, Pastor, everybody can't serve in ministry. I mean, what would everybody do? Why? Well, I, I disagree. There are people that God wants, God wants to fill this room with people who need him. He wants to fill this place. And, and as we who are here are saying, God, what is my place? How, how, do, I, how do I cultivate the unity in, in the church? How do I do things that, that create the, the atmosphere of, how do I use what you have put in me to make a difference in, in, the, in the church family how do I cultivate that place? How do I um, find that place? Of, and, and I'm going to share with you what that's like in a moment. I, I won't do that now. Um, I love 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, because it really strengthens an idea of, of something that we talked about a few weeks ago. Do you remember the message on, on where we talked about grace and gifts, and, one, and, the, and the grace is charis, and the gifts are um, charisma? And, and how closely related those two things are. The grace that empowers us to be saved is the same grace that God gives us to be used for him. Right? Y'all are looking at me like you don't remember this. This was like three weeks ago. Okay? Um, I, don't, I don't do any of this. I don't use these gifts because... I'm, I've figured something out or I'm better than somebody else or I've gotten better at something than somebody else. It is by God's grace, right? I'm saved by grace and I'm empowered by grace to use my gifts to serve the Lord. Paul is emphasizing that to Timothy, a young minister, when he says, look, God who has saved us, that's grace to save us, has done what? He has also called us with a holy calling. You see that? You see it? Come on, read it with me. Y'all, y'all, some of y'all need to punch your neighbor with your elbow just a little bit. Here we go. Let's read together now. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. So, so here we see again, he saved us and he called us, and it's all by his grace. Um, he's given us gifts. He wants us to use them. And yes, we want to develop them. And yes, we want to hone them. Yes, we want to grow in them and, 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 and create an environment where God can use us in even greater ways. But every moment of every day that God uses us, we are reminded, Lord, it is by your grace. It is by your grace. You are the one who, who does this. You are the one who, who, who works this work in me. So we see from this verse, number one, that our focus is always on Jesus. We were given this by, by, by Jesus. Our focus is on him. Um, our only connection to one another in this room is not just the fact that we are in Shreveport, Bossier. That could change for anybody at any given time. The only connection we have is Jesus. What brings us here is, is Jesus. It's our connection to one another. Um, and so, so therefore, then, his desire for others becomes something that motivates us. What is it that God wants for you? 
Does he want my giftedness to be a part of this? What, what is it that God has for you? How do I come to bear on, on God's purpose being fulfilled in your life? What is it that God has put in you that needs to come to bear on the lives of others? others what is that giftedness what is that calling in Christ Jesus that holy calling that you have been given because of Jesus this becomes a motivator in our life it's not just pastor keeps talking about going to discover celebration so I can get on the dream team and serve y'all th those are the kind of the mechanics of it but the heart of it all is God's called me with a high and holy calling. He called me in Christ Jesus. And if I, if, I, if I can believe that there is grace to save me, I can believe there's grace for God to use me. And that supersedes anything else that's going on in your life. That supersedes any busyness. It supersedes any challenges that you feel like you face because of maybe your childhood or your upbringing or your family situation or your anything. It supersedes all of those things to trust that God has called me. And there are, there are people in this family and there are people in other countries and there are people in my workplace. There are people in my life that will not receive the ministry that God has intended for them to receive from my life if I don't recognize that God has called me and he wants to use me. It's true for every one of you. You say, Pastor, if you just knew my story, you'd know it wasn't me. That might not be you today. You might say you're not, but you're, but, you're, but you're that far away from saying, Lord, I humble myself before you. Lord, I'm, I'm crying out to you. God, will you, will you save me? Will, will you rescue my life? And he'll say, oh, yeah, I'll save you. I'll rescue your life, and I'll call you, and I'll use you to be a blessing. I'll use you to touch someone else's life. We learn this from Jesus. You see it in your notes right there. Jesus did his ministry by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. You see it throughout the Gospels. He, he, he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, now think about it. You say, well, Jesus was God, so why would that need to be? Well, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. And human Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Two reasons. Number one, because he was human, he was tempted in every way that we're tempted. But yet he was without sin. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He also did it to set the example, to show us the way, to, to, to prepare us to recognize, hey, if Jesus had to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, who in the world am I to think that I could minister any other way? Right? That there would be, I mean, who are we to think that there would be anything good that would come from our life that would come from any other source or any other means, then God worked in our life. God touched our life. God spoke to us. He dealt with us. And he desired to flow through our lives, not of our works. You remember from 2 Timothy 1.9. It was not because of you. And again, well, that's my salvation, Pastor. No, that's your ministry as well. It's not because of you. It's because of his heart for people, his love for people. So he connects us around Jesus, and then he sends us out. In the same way Jesus ministered, we, he sends us out to continue his ministry filled with power, empowered by him, um, gifted by the Holy Spirit to be used for God. The same way Jesus did ministry, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do ministry. How? Come on, everybody say it. By the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we do it. If we're going to do what Jesus did, if we're going to continue his ministry, then it's going to involve the gifts that he supplies. That's really good news. I don't have to be the source. He's the source. So how do we do this? Well, it begins by having an understanding. We're still in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Now to each one, now to each one the manifestation. What does manifestation mean? I, I tried to simplify it for us to understand it this way. How does manifest would be to, for something to be made known? Manifest in this context would just simply be, how does, if, okay, how many of you are spiritually alive in Christ? God's spirit is in you. Come on, let's see some hands. You, you know you're, you, you're confident you're spiritually alive. That spirit that is alive in you wants to 
um, present from your life. Where, where you, your life is hidden in Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, there, there, there are places in your life where God uses you, where, where, where people um, recognize, wow, God's hands on your life. God, God must have directed you to say that to me because that was just what I needed. God, God, Holy Spirit wants to manifest. So that's what's talked about here. Um, it is uh, t- now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for. Come on, say it with me. The common good. To make a show, to make a presentation, to be sensationalized, to be make someone look really big and no. For the common good. J- just ministry, just ministry. L- let me tell you, your destiny. Who, who you were meant to be in Christ was uniquely prepared by God for you. And it was to help you to live beyond your natural ability. You, your gift is a, is a divine capability that God, again, the word I like to use, that God entrusts to you. Okay? God entrusts you um, it's, it's a divine ability or capability, and it exceeds your, your own natural, obvious abilities. Again, if we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7 in a different version, it says it this way. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Probably a little oversimplified, but it, again, it helps us to see the thought that God wants his spirit to move out from our life to make a difference in the lives of other people. No exceptions. No exceptions. What it might look for you right now might look different than somebody else, but every gift is important. Every gift is valued. Every, every gift is needed. No, no gift or, or is, is promoted above another or exalted above another. It creates dysfunction. It, dis, it creates division and strife. No, we want to be a church family that says, God has called you. God has put his hand on your life. What is it for? What does he want from you? And it doesn't matter if it, one looks a little more spectacular than, it, than, than another. We recognize everyone is needed. Everyone is valued. God put that on, on, on a person's heart, on their life to make a difference um, for him and for his glory. So, so this is why God gives us both grace and gifts. Grace to empower us, gifts so he can use us. Pastor, I just thought grace was how God saved me. He just saved me by his grace. I merited favor. I didn't deserve it. He saved me. The word means empowered. When you read by grace, you are saved. What you're reading is by God's empowerment, God's ability. God did it. He saved you by his power. The same God who saved you. How many of you believe God saved you by his grace? Same God wants to use you by his grace. Please, um, we we should set our hearts apart for God. We should live holy lives. I'm I'm not diminishing the importance of any of that. But if you think one day, my salvation isn't by works, I'm saved by grace, but I'm gonna earn the right to get to do something for God, you miss it. The same grace that saves you is the same grace that empowers you to be used by God. And he's called you to be used by him. So God gives us grace, his empowerment, and gifts. Um, The the opportunity to steward something that belongs to him. Those things together, that's what empowers us to fulfill our calling. Look at the next statement in your notes. And, and this will begin to kind of take us toward the close. It's kind of a long way around, but, but it, it kind of starts to turn the corner that direction. I want to appropriately, y'all know, y'all, I think y'all know this. I'm, I'm not here to put a condemnation on anyone. I'm not here to, certainly to, in any way, to um, get you to do something because you feel arm twisted. I believe that this is the most empowering message and encouraging message. 
But it's tempting to just say, hey, I'm going to throw this out there, and if you, if, you, if you want to do this, man, we'd love to have you discover celebration, taking next steps, and the church will be stronger if you're used. I, I want to I lean in a little bit from a scriptural standpoint and say, look, we are individually responsible to be stewards of the gifts that God has given us. There, there's a responsibility um, we should feel a, an appropriate level of, of weight on us that says, look, if I just stay within myself, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, I'm going to heaven, I'm just going to kind of stay within myself. Someone is not receiving the ministry that God desires for them because you chose to stay within yourself. We want to feel an appropriate weightiness of, of responsibility before God to steward what he's put in us. We want to, to, to feel if I don't use my, the gifts that God has given me, if I don't use it properly, someone is not going to experience the benefit of it. I'm not going to experience the blessing of being used by God. Someone is not going to receive what God would have intended for them to receive because this is how his kingdom works. He puts gifts in us, and, and, he, and he's the one who said, look, these things that I do, when, when you guys do this together, it's going to be even greater than what I did. Jesus says, I'm one person, I'm in one place. You guys are going to span the globe. And what you'll do together will be even greater than what I did. He was talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about us. Th that, that, ought to, that ought to kind of rest on our shoulders with some, some kind of weight. So you, you, you really you have three options when it comes to, to giftedness, and everyone has gifts. The first option is you can say, well, I know that God has given me a gift in this area. Some of you, you were born with a high level of giftedness. You have the option of saying, I'm just going to use it for my own benefit. You join a lot of people in that. Some of you are here and you love Jesus, but if you really had to answer the question of how have you used your giftedness, you, you might would have to say, well, I, I've used it mostly for myself. Made money, influenced people, and I'm not saying negatively influenced them, but you've, you've used giftedness, but it's mostly been for your own benefit. Um, the, the second one is we can determine... I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to use what God has given me. And again, sometimes they're natural abilities that, that clearly have the touch of God on them. You say that, that person, that's pretty natural for them. But you recognize that God has used them greatly. God, God's used that in a great way. Um, other times, it's things that are completely outside of what might seem natural for them. And I, I can share a personal testimony on that. My life has kind of been the tale of those two, two things. Um, so the second thing we can do, though, is, is we can determine, God, I'm going to use the gifts you've given me to, to build your kingdom, to work for you. I'm going to use them to serve you, whether it's in my workplace, my job, I'm at the hospital, I'm at the plant, I'm at the store, whatever, wherever your life takes you during the day, among my family. God, I'm going to take what you've put in me and I'm going to use it to, 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 to grow your kingdom, to work for you. Or you can just neglect it altogether. You have those three options. I really think for believers, the only option is to say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I want to be used by you. Um, in, in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we've covered this verse earlier in the series. But once again, Paul is, is answering these questions, and it's woven throughout the tapestry of this entire letter when he says, Look, when people look at you, let them see you as a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God. And what's required of a steward? That he be found faithful. So our hearts have to say, God, I'm accountable for the gifts that are in me. Lord, I want to be faithful. Is that your heart? 
Is that your heart? Is that your heart to say, God, I want to be faithful with what you've put in me. It's, It's required of a steward. It's not even given as an option. I think Paul's speaking to this church and saying, look, y'all are abusing this. You're misusing this. You've gotten this off the rails. And the gifts are are my gifts. They're gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to use them to serve one another. You're servants of Christ. You're stewards of this great mystery called the church. So let me remind you. Would you look at your notes with me? Let me remind you of your understanding, our understanding of the role of the steward. What does that role look like? How many of you know, how many of you, you might not would say, well, you may or may not would say, yes, I've taken a spiritual gifts test and I know based on that test what my gifts are. Uh, Others of you might would say, I kind of know how God uses me and and kind of where I'm gifted. How many of you feel like you do know that? Uh, Let's see some hands in the room. You kind of know. A lot of you, I think, is, I think you should be really challenged by the message today to say, I've got to dive deeper into this and understand it. Here's, here's your responsibility as a steward. And if you're a Christian, you're a steward. He says here, he says, I, I, I want you to see, I, I'm humbly overseeing something that belongs to God. If you recognize what's, what God has given you, what God has entrusted to you isn't yours, that it's his, then you'll be a little less quick to make excuses. Let me just tell you, you don't need to make excuses to me. Well, Pastor, we're just so busy, and if we just, you know, one one day we're going to be less busy, and we're going to be able to, you know, spend some more time, we're going to be able to serve. You don't need to tell me that. Tell the one who has entrusted you with the gift and has called you to be a steward of it that you don't have time. Your gift doesn't belong to me. Your gift belongs to him right? Your gift belongs to him. He is the one who has entrusted it to you. So, so a, a steward says, I'm only humbly overseeing something that belongs to God. Second, I'm the one who has the authority to man, manage what has been trusted to me. Am I using it for myself? Am I ignoring it altogether? Or is there an appropriate area of my life where I'm saying, God, this is yours. I'm, I'm committed to fulfilling my assignment for you. The third point here is I'm responsible And I will give an account to the owner. Who's the owner of the gift? God is. I'll give an account to God. I believe it's very dangerous for us to neglect a God-given gift. Pastor, I'm just kind of timid. I'm a little bit shy. I'm a little backward. I'm a little bit whatever. No, you don't need to tell me that. Talk to the Lord about it. He is the one who's given you the gift. You're responsible. You'll give an account to him for it. Your gift is not for you. Your gift is for others. And God's called you to minister. Here's where I want to close. What's the importance, as if I needed to say anything more about it, what's the importance of walking in our specific calling? And again, I didn't really go into this. Some of you kind of will ask the question when we talked about it in the staff this week about this message conversation was kind of around people want to know how do they find their gift how do they find their gift to that i would say a great place to start would be discover celebration in a couple of weeks you'll take a gifts test you'll do a little survey you'll you'll know what yours potentially are as as helpful as something like that can be Th- those are practical things that we can help you with i didn't even try to go into the gifts it would be way too much to do in a message But let me talk to you about why it's important that you get on this journey and maybe through some trial and error you find, you know, how God wants to use you and what his desire is to allow who he is in you to to show up in in work and, and, and other areas of your life and certainly for you to be connected in the church, loving and serving people, using your gifts. Here's, here's why it's important. I'm going to give you the first few real quick, and then I'm going to lean into the last one. Here's the first one. I believe it's the only way that you're going to be satisfied and fulfilled. You say, well, Pastor, I've got a whole lot going on in my life. I'm just real. Listen, people in the world talk a, a big game about what they got going, their, their hobbies and their interests, and how much money they've made, and, and all kind of stuff. 
Maybe you've had these kind of conversations. I can promise you as a pastor, I've been in the, in the room. And the curtains pulled back a little bit. And the emptiness of a life that only pursues the things of the world becomes crystal clear and evident by their own testimony. Pastor, I just, you know, I don't know if it's all been worth it or not. I, you begin to fulfill calling for the Lord. Yeah, work hard, make a lot of money, but recognize this is for a calling. This is for a purpose. God wants to use it. God wants to use my life. Um, develop skills, develop talent. If you're a manager, become the best manager, but recognize there's, that God wants to use that. Whatever it is that God has gifted you with, He desires to use that in your life, and you'll never be satisfied apart from it. Second one, it's the only way to renew your strength for this life. I know a lot of people that are tired, they're worn out. Oh, we just got so, we just. But then I know people who said, you know, I. I when I push through and I lead my group and I, and I show up for my serve and I, I make it, there's just, man, I just feel revived by that. I, I'm just energized by being used by God. I, I, I enjoy when, uh, and, and God will never leave you hanging on that kind of thing. It's like physically I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired, I'm a little exhausted, but man, I just feel renewed. When you allow God to begin to use what he's put in you for his purposes, there's a renewing of your strength that is, 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 is beautiful. Here's the third one. It's the best way to truly thrive and experience the blessing in your life. You want to experience blessing on this side of heaven? You, it happens when you let God use you. And, and I would just say again, some of you are like, I don't know where to start. Just start where you are. I don't have any idea. Talk to your small group leader. Talk to a team leader. Talk to one of our staff members. Find somebody you trust that, that you consider to be more spiritual than you are. Talk to them and, and, and begin to take some steps. I believe, number four, it's, it's really the source of genuine, lasting joy. The final one is you will be eternally rewarded. Everybody say that. Eternally rewarded. We don't talk about this kind of thing enough. We'll say things like this life is just, just kind of practice for eternity and, you know, and it's just getting us ready for eternity. I don't think we even begin. I don't think we even begin to understand how much that this life is preparation for eternity. Do you know that the Bible teaches that, you know, sometimes I, I did a message on heaven one time and I think I asked, kind of people to give thoughts about heaven and someone said, what are we going to do in heaven? You know, I mean, it's just going to be little fat babies with harps flying around and we're just going to kind of it's just like forever, we're going to be around the throne bowing down and no, there will be activity in heaven. Things will happen in heaven and you'll have an assignment in heaven. You know how you get your assignment in heaven? It's not because of your good looks or your talent at that moment. It will be based upon you'll be rewarded Scripture says we will rule and reign with him for eternity. There will be assignments given in heaven, and it's going to be based upon the faithful use of your giftedness here. Are you willing to let God use you here? And, and, and he'll say to you, Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So we're going to be judged. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to have the opportunity to give an account for our life. And one day we're going to stand before him. And we want to have said, Lord, I took what you gave me and I used it. I was, I was faithful. I, I grew in my gifts. I, I learned and... And I gave you the opportunity, Lord, on every occasion. God, I, I grew in it. I didn't despise the gifts. I, I wanted to be used. I wanted to be your voice. I wanted to be your hands. I was willing to go where you said to go. That's what he desires for us. So 
what he longs for from you. And that's what I want to ask today. You just allow him to begin to speak to your heart on. Will you close your eyes with me? Lord, I just speak over the celebration family. Lord, whether the people in this room arrived today or a year ago or five years ago or 15 years ago on October 4th of 2009, we're here to say, Lord, we're your family at celebration. We offer you. Lord, in return for you having been the source of of every gift, of every blessing in our life, Lord, we're here to humbly say we are stewards and we want to be used by you. Can you tell him that in your own words? Lord, I'm available to you. Lord, would you speak to my heart? Would you speak through my life? Would you use me? I'm available to you. Lord, however your Holy Spirit wants to present through my life, I'm not going to live just unto myself. I'm going to be willing to be your hands. I'm going to be willing to be your feet. And God, I recognize that one day I'll stand before your throne. And Lord, I'll give an account for how I use this life that you gave me as a gift. Lord, help us to not be like the people at the church at Corinth who misunderstood the gifts and they thought that there was more value in in something that was more sensational. Help us to, Lord, place a value on the giftedness of every person in this room. Every singer, every musician, every greeter, every children's worker, the people who will who began to clean the building after the service, those that prepared before we got here. Lord, every gift that comes to bear, Lord, our prayer team today, Lord, that we use their gifts. Lord, thank you that we're a family, we're a body, and we're used by you. Lord, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you and they need to receive grace to save, Lord, right now, as they confess, God, that they are a sinner, Lord, would you come in with a rush of your mercy and grace and save them. Touch their life, Lord Jesus. Um, Set them apart for you and for your glory and for your purposes. Jesus, we thank you for redemption that has, has come to someone's life in this room, even as they have heard the music and even as they have heard the word today. Lord, their hearts have melted before you and they are right now saying yes to your eternal work in their life. Thank you for saving us, Jesus. And God, thank you for calling us to your purpose and to your plan today. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.